actually uh, came across John while reading the Zcash white paper um, for SF cryptocurrency devs because we wanted to talk about uh, zero knowledge proofs. And then I was like, cuckoo cycle, what, what is this stuff? Um, and then you read uh, John Trump's GitHub and you're like, my God, he is amazing. He is amazing. And I never thought I'd meet him um, and give him a high five. Thank you, John. So uh, John is going to talk to us about cuckoo, cuckoo. Please give him a round of applause. Welcome, John Trump. Okay, uh, let's wait for my slides to appear. Oh, there we go. So welcome to cycling class. I will discuss the, uh, <laughs> the proof of work of Grin called uh, Kaku Cycle. And uh, I'll start explaining what is a proof of work. Uh, the, uh, the inspiration for Kaku Cycle, which is from a computer science data structure known as uh, hash tables, specifically the Kaku hash table. Uh, I'll actually prove some interesting theorem about uh, the number of uh, expected number of solutions for Cuckoo Cycle. And then I'll discuss the algorithms we use to solve this problem. Uh, there's the cycle finding, uh, and actually there is the even more important edge trimming, which really forms the uh, majority of the mining effort. There's uh, two forms of that uh, edge trimming, lean and mean, which I'll explain what are the differences. And there's also several variants in the cuckoo cycle family. Uh, uh, important one is uh, cockatoo cycle, uh, the, the one geared for ASICs. And there's also the kakaroo, which is uh, less, less interesting. So let's get going. What is the proof of work? Uh, this was concept was introduced uh, back in 92 by uh, researchers Cynthia Dwork and Moni Naur as a way to fight spam. So the idea is that uh, in order for somebody to get access to your attention, they should prove that they are worthy of your attention. They should spend some effort to get your attention. So they'll have to solve uh, a puzzle. And the puzzle is going to take some serious effort to solve, but it's going to be easy for you to verify because you don't want to spend uh, much resources on people wanting your attention. Also, it's important that uh, any solution to the puzzle is only usable once. It's not reusable for different people, for different uh, messages, or for different times. So it has to be, the puzzle has to be tied to some message. Let's say a combination of uh, a recipient and uh, a header and, uh, and time. Uh, here you see an example uh, puzzle called uh, Eternity. This is a uh, very tough jigsaw puzzle that was introduced in summer uh, 1999 with a one million pound uh, prize. Um, it was uh, projected to, to take uh, several years to solve. Every year peop uh, people can send in uh, solutions all the time and every year on a fixed date they would re uh, reveal all the submitted solutions and if any were, were correct. Uh, it didn't take four years. It actually was solved uh, uh, May of next year by two uh, British uh, mathematicians. And then uh, they came out in 97 with a new puzzle, Eternity 2, this time with a $2 million prize. So you can view this as a, uh, as a uh, blockchain with a very high block reward that's currently stuck on block two. <laughs> Nobody has solved <laughs> Eternity 2. But uh, yeah, you can see uh, this, this took a long time to solve and it's very easy to verify that this is a solution. So you just have these 209 puzzle pieces. Uh, it has not really succeeded too well as a spam fighting measure. The uh, integration into uh, popular email clients proved a, a big stumbling block. But proof of work has been very, very successful as a key ingredient in cryptocurrencies. Satoshi Nakamoto adopted proof of work as uh, the way to achieve uh, consensus uh, in, in Bitcoin. Uh, not only that, also as a way to distribute coins. So these are two very important uh, purposes of proof of work. Uh, it reaches consensus by everybody agreeing to work on the, to identify and work on the longest chain, the one that has the most accumulated proof of work. 
And as long as a majority of miners stick to this rule, then the whole history of transactions will, uh, will converge. Any uh, possible branches will be quickly resolved just by laws of probability. Uh, for application in, uh, as, as proof of work, uh, we also need another property that we can generate these puzzles to be of any desired complexity. So most people equate the whole concept of proof of work with a particular instance of it called Hashcash. And this is because almost all the cryptocurrencies use some form of Hashcash. So in Hashcash, uh, the puzzle is that uh, you want to find an input to a hash function uh, following uh, some, uh, the, the message that it has to be tied to, such that the hash output is very small. It falls below some threshold. So by making this threshold very small, you can make it very hard to find such, a, such an input. Uh, so the many different proofs of work that you find in all the thousands of uh, cryptocurrencies, they just use different flavors of hash function. Bitcoin picked uh, SHA-256 twice, and then uh, uh, Tenebricks picked a uh, script, which was uh, copied by uh, Litecoin. Uh, there's uh, Dash with X11 and Kryptonite with, uh, no, what is it? Uh, Monero, yeah, picking Kryptonite. Uh, but these, there, there are other proofs of work besides uh, Hashcash, so not all mining is hashing. And those al alternatives are, are so-called uh, asymmetric proofs of work. The, uh, the attempt to find a solution is not the same as uh, verifying a solution. The first example was in uh, 2013 PrimeCoin, where uh, you want to f find certain uh, sequences of prime numbers, so-called uh, Cunningham chains. So it's like a sequence uh, 5, 11, 23, 47, where each successive prime is uh, twice the previous 1 plus 1. Or it could also be a sequence in which it's uh, twice the previous minus one. So, uh, of course, the, the primes you need to find for that are not just small numbers. They are huge numbers. Uh, and the digits of the, the numbers themselves or the starting number also has to commit again to the current uh, state of the chain. Uh, so finding such a, a sequence of uh, primes is, uh, is quite a different effort from verifying. We have simple proofs of, uh, of primality. Uh, later that year, uh, there was the uh, momentum uh, proof of work, uh, which amounts to just finding uh, two inputs that have the same hash output. So it's a basic uh, birthday collision. And this, uh, this formed the uh, inspiration of Cuckoo Cycle because I was following the discussion of that. And the creator also uh, offered money rewards for people who could break the scheme. Uh, it turned out that momentum was badly broken. Uh, you can, uh, it was intended to require uh, a lot of memory, but uh, for birthday collision, we can, uh, we can get away with using uh, uh, Q times uh, less memory while suffering only a square root Q slowdown. And this, uh, this is a very, very practical, feasible uh, trade-off. So momentum wouldn't be using uh, as much memory as intended. Uh, so that led me somehow to uh, develop a cuckoo cycle, which we can view as not a, a one-way, uh, a one-birthday collision, but a simultaneous 42-way collision. Uh, this was uh, improved in 2014 after several people found ways to uh, improve my initial uh, algorithms for solving it. And having incorporated those improvements, I uh, published a paper in the uh, Bitcoin 2015 workshop. Uh, later that year, we saw the appearance of Equihash, which is in many ways uh, similar to Cuckoo Cycle. Both can be seen as uh, generalizations of momentum, of the basic birthday collision. In the case of Equihash, you want to find uh, uh, an uh, 2 to the k uh, uh, inputs such that their hash outputs have an exclusive OR of zero, and also the intermediate 
uh, exclusive ORs, uh, when you present them in a binary tree, they also have initial uh, zero segments. Uh, an interesting asymmetric POW is uh, ETH hash, in which verification is actually slower than a proof attempt. This is because uh, the miners use a very large multi gigabyte uh, data set that is generated every uh, 125 hours, so around five days. And they search for some pattern in this data set. And in order to verify it, uh, the verifiers don't, don't need to use the whole data set, but they can uh, verify it from the uh, smaller cache that the data set is generated from. And that is only 30 megabytes. So it's still uh, some, somewhat memory intensive to verify. Uh, the advantage of Equihash and Cuckoo Cycle and Momentum uh, is that they're all instantly verifiable, which is a very desirable feature. It requires no memory and, uh, and no, practically no time. So this, yeah, this is, the this is the basic advantage of asymmetric powers. They allow you to increase the memory requirement without slowing down verification. In systems like uh, uh, Kryptonite, uh, they chose or many other coins too, which are instances of hash cache, they choose a hash function which requ requires uh, significant memory to run, but that means that the verifier also has to expand that much memory. So those systems are al always limited in the amount of memory they can require. Ver you cannot expect verifiers to, to use uh, a gigabyte of memory. You want uh, small, uh, uh, small devices with limited resources to be able to do verification. So the inspiration for Cuckoo Cycle comes from, uh, from uh, hash tables. And the hash table, as the name suggests, is just uh, a, na uh, a table of elements, uh, a table of slots where you can store data items. And you use a hash function to map a data item to a possible slot. Uh, so here we see uh, the data item 11 being hashed to that location, and it could be stored there. Of course, it's possible that you hash a data item to uh, an already occupied slot, as happens here, uh, in which case you just look for consecutive uh, slots to find an empty one. Uh, as soon as you find uh, uh, an empty slot uh, and you haven't found the element you're looking for, then it's simply not in the table. Uh, downside of this is that uh, you may take many, many steps to, to find a slot for your element. So then, um, in 2004, some people, uh, Park and Rodler, had some uh, very cute idea for a cuckoo hash table. This is really a pair of hash tables. So you have a pair of tables with each their own hash function, and you can store a data item in either of the two locations. But you only ever check those two locations. You don't look in consecutive slots. So uh, if we have an element eight and we check uh, the two locations. One is occupied, the other is available, so that's good. We can store it there. Um, what happens if, uh, if both are occupied? Where do we store the, the eight? Well, we take inspiration from this bird, the cuckoo, to just kick out the 11 and put the egg in the nest. Uh, now, uh, we want to take care of this 11 that we kicked out. Fortunately, this 11 also has an alternative uh, location in the other table, so we can just see where does 11 go. It could also go there. Uh, so you want to store it there, uh, but also that can be occupied. So you just repeat this process. Whenever you want to put it in the alternate location, maybe you kick out some element that's there, and then you just find a new place for that element. Uh, we can visualize the uh, uh, the current state of a cuckoo hash table with a uh, directed graph. Uh, I have to apologize for this being an older version of the presentation in which these arrows are going the wrong way. The idea is that the arrows go from the current location of a data item to its alternate location. So uh, to see where uh, a new a data item ends up, actually this is, this is the correct one. Uh, is that the case? No, it's not. Uh, to see then where an item ends up, you just follow the path of uh, edges to the endpoint. And in this case, that works fine. So we would be storing uh, 8 there, move 11 there, and 19 ends up there. 
uh, problem arises if you get back to an earlier slot that you, uh, where you evicted an item from. And we see that, we see that happening here. If the 19 is sent back to where element 2 was, 2 can go down and kick out 30. Uh, but now we've created a cycle. And this, uh, this, is a, a, this is a potential problem for the Cuckoo hash table, because now any element that, needs to, that has both locations among these five will not be able to fit. So that's according to the, uh, uh, the pigeonhole principle. Uh, that says you cannot fit uh, six items into five locations. So a cycle in this directed uh, Kaku graph is a uh, necessary but not sufficient condition for, uh, for, uh, for a failure to, to store an item. So here then is the, the general Kaku cycle problem we consider a, uh, gra a bipartite graph, which consists of, uh, of n edges between n nodes in the upper partition and another n nodes in the lower partition. So we have, uh, instead of the two hash functions, we just have a single hash function, but we, uh, we take an edge index and then uh, followed by a zero or by a one and feed that into the hash function to give us the two endpoints of an edge. Uh, and in this case, we would have uh, the edges with the indices 2, 8, 11, and 19 forming a, a four cycle. So uh, one parameter of Cuckoo cycle is, the, uh, is a particular cycle length. And the goal is to find uh, a cycle of that length in, a, in such a, a random bipartite graph. And in the case of, uh, in the case of green, those will be, uh, the number n will be pretty large, around a, a billion uh, nodes. So here is a smaller cuckoo graph on just uh, 256 edges, and here's a slightly larger one on uh, 2 to the 12 edges. So let's see how we can uh, identify those uh, cycles. Oh no, okay. Here comes the the the, the mathy part. We can actually uh, exactly compute the expected number of cycles. And for that, we have a notion of, a, uh, of an anchored cycle. Um, so in an actual uh, cycle of, let's say, 42 edges, we can make one distinguished edge called uh, an anchor and start listing the indices starting from the anchor and then following the incidences in the, in the upper and then in the lower and in the upper. And this way, we end up uh, numbering all these uh, edges from index 1 through index 42. Uh, and with that notion, uh, so a potential anchored cycle will be just any sequence of uh, 42 indices. Then uh, to compute the expected number of anchored cycles, we just have the, uh, the possible number of these sequences, which is n to the power 42, times the probability that such a sequence forms uh, an anchored cycle. And that means that uh, you have to have those 42 uh, edge uh, incidences. So that's, again, uh, 1 over n to the power of 42. So multiplied together, we see that the expected number of anchored cycles is exactly 1, uh, no matter what the cycle length is. But of course, uh, to anchor uh, an L cycle, you have L possible choices. That means that the, num the expected number of cycles is just a fraction 1 over L of that. So this is how we end up with uh, uh, a fraction only uh, 1 over 42 of all the graphs that you search uh, having, a, having a 42 cycle. Uh, by the way, I found this nice picture of a cycle that's anchored to a wall, and uh, the anchor itself reminds me a little bit of Grin. Uh, in this analysis, I ignored the, uh, uh, the possibility that uh, different indices can be identical. So if you do this exactly, then you end up with this uh, formula. Uh, the expected number of L cycles uh, among n edges is again this fraction 1 over L, but then it has these uh, factors. And that's uh, uh, an n to the falling L, which you also see in uh, binomial coefficients. That's n times n minus 1 up to n minus L plus 1. And again, uh, 
a similar term with uh, uh, the square of a smaller falling power. So when n is uh, really much larger than L, then those uh, fudge factors uh, are close to one, as we see in the bottom, uh, where the expected number of 42 cycles is 0 0.9999988 over 42. But if your graph is uh, um, smaller, uh, for instance, uh, 2 to the 12, then we can see we have a significant reduction already in the, in the chance of a 42 cycle. So in the use of a uh, cuckoo cycle as proof of work, n will always be way larger. And we can just assume this 1 over L uh, expectation. Okay, now we consider the, the algorithms for solving the, the problem of finding a cycle in such a random bipartite graph. Uh, I will discuss uh, uh, two algorithms. Uh, uh, both uh, add uh, the random edges one at a time and then uh, try to see if that edge forms a cycle. There is the, uh, the, the cuckoo miner that is actually inspired by the operation of the cuckoo hash table and that doesn't find all possible cycles but it finds the so-called cycle base. So that's uh, the cycles you can form by having a tree, uh, an acyclic tree, and then all possible uh, edges added to that tree which form a cycle. So in case, in the cases where the, the multiple cycles in the graph overlap, you, you may not find all of them. But uh, it, in practice that would only be a smaller, small fraction that you overlook. Uh, the other miner is uh, more straightforward and will is guaranteed to find all the cycles. So here is the, how the miner emulating the cuckoo hash table works. Again, we have uh, the cuckoo, the directed cuckoo graph that points from where we would store a data item to the alternate location. And uh, we can see that is uh, still a, a it's a so-called uh, directed forest, which means that it has a bunch of components which are uh, uh, acyclic uh, trees. Uh, when we add a new edge, let's say between uh, node U and V, we can follow the path from those two nodes to end up at the root of U and the root of V and see if those are the same. Uh, in this example, they are different. So then we are free to reverse one of the paths which gives us the, the, uh, the ability to store, uh, to, to add a directed edge uh, from the reversed part to the other part. In this case, uh, it's, it's, it makes more sense to revert the path from U because that is a shorter path, so it will require less effort. And the result is, uh, is this. So again, we have uh, reversed that path of two edges and that allows us to add another edge. The, the limit of these uh, graphs is that the out degree is at most one. So any node that already has an out degree, we cannot add a new, a new edge to. That's why we require the, uh, the path reversal. Uh, in the other case, uh, where we choose two nodes, U and V, that have the same root as depicted here, um, uh, where we have identified a case where we'll, we would form a cycle if we, uh, if we added uh, an edge between U and V. So we, we don't do that in order to run this algorithm. We need to maintain uh, an acyclic tree, but we can uh, identify the, the cycle, how long it is, and whether we should report it as a, as a, as a solution. So the advantage of this algorithm is that it's pretty memory efficient. We need only uh, one word per, per node in the graph. Um, so that's uh, 64 bits uh, per edge because the number of nodes is twice the number of edges. Um, downside of this uh, algorithm is that all the accesses to the nodes are, are very random, so it causes high latency. Uh, the other miner uh, is more straightforward, although this picture looks uh, a bit daunting. Uh, the idea is whenever you add an edge, you're going to search uh, the graph from that edge onward to see if it's, is it's, if it's the start of any uh, cycle. So that's just a standard depth first search that we all know from uh, computer science. Uh, we just 
follow edges from any node that we are in during the search. We try all possible outgoing edges. Uh, and we have another ad additional uh, bitmap to keep track of which nodes we visited during the search so we can recognize when we're going back in a loop. And then whenever we get stuck, we backtrack and try the other branches. Uh, this, this search is, of course, limited to a depth of 42 since we're not, we're not interested in any cycles of a length more than 42. Uh, this picture shows the actual uh, uh, representation of the, of the graph that you need for doing this search. So uh, you have, uh, for, for every node, you have a list of all the edges adjacent to it. And in this representation, each edge is split into two half edges. So uh, there's a, li there's a, uh, a linked list uh, across all the uh, half edges adjacent to a node. And then uh, the two half edges forming an edge are, are in adjacent memory locations, so we can easily uh, switch between those. Each, each half edge also points back to the node that it is adjacent to. Uh, so if we, uh, if we count the space used, then it is uh, 32 bits per node to point to the start of the adjacency list. And in every, ad, in every half edge, we have to point to the next member in the adjacency list and also in the, to the back to the node that it's adjacent to. So that's 64 bits per half edge and 128 bits per edge. Altogether, 192 bits per edge. Uh, so that's three times more than in the other algorithm. But uh, uh, the advantage is that we are guaranteed to find uh, all the cycles. And again, this also suffers from the same high latency. So this was my, uh, this, th these are the basic uh, algorithms to ad actually identify the, the cycles. You could call them cycle uh, chasers. But uh, this is not the best way to find cycles. Uh, one issue is, again, that they use quite a bit of uh, memory, at least 64 bits per edge. Uh, as I mentioned before, all these accesses are random, so causing a lot of uh, latency. And the third issue is that these are very uh, sequential algorithms. So you, cannot, you have to run them single-threaded. All these uh, updates that you do to the graph uh, would lead to cha chaos if you, if you allowed multiple threads to perform them in parallel. So altogether, this is pretty uh, slow approach. And um, in, in back in 2014, even before uh, the first published uh, version of Cuckoo Cycle, there's this professor from uh, CMU, uh, David Anderson, who uh, identified a uh, big memory savings that turned out to be uh, very cru crucial. So this is uh, the process of uh, edge trimming. If this is our uh, cuckoo graph, we can see there are several edges that are adjacent to leaf nodes, nodes which with, with no other uh, edges adjacent to them, just like this uh, edge here. And this edge is never going to be part of a cycle because it has nowhere to go. So if we can identify those uh, edges, then we can just uh, cut them out. So uh, in the first step here, we'll, we'll cut away those two edges that are adjacent to a leaf node. And that forms, again, new leaf nodes. So we can cut away uh, more edges. And you just repeat this process. At every step, you look at the new leaf nodes that you've created in one of the partitions. And then uh, you, you remove all the edges adjacent to those. And if you could keep doing that, then... Oops. Uh, at the end, what you'll be left with is uh, uh, a bunch of untrimmable nodes, uh, edge, an untrimmable edges, and those form uh, cycles and possibly paths uh, between cycles. In this case, we, form, we find just uh, a single four cycle. Uh, here's an example of the, uh, uh, the edge trimming process. Um, this is uh, a graph with uh, 1,024 edges. And in the first trimming round, you can see we cut out a lot of edges. Uh, you can analyze this mathematically, uh, and you will always cut out a fraction of uh, about 1 over e. So that's 36% uh, of the edges. 
uh, you can also mathematically analyze the, the how much you cut in the second round, which will be uh, a more than a factor of two. So here you're left with uh, about 30% uh, uh, of all the edges. And then you can do more and more trimming rounds. And if you were to go all the way, again, you would just be left with, in this case, a six cycle. Um, for the sizes that we actually deal with in green of billions of nodes, it would actually take uh, thousands of trimming rounds to go this far, but, but we don't do that. We just do uh, uh, a hundred or a few hundred rounds, and then we've already cut down our edges to, uh, to only like 0.1% of the original amount. And that's when we can switch back to one of the other algorithms to actually find uh, the cycles. Um, So there's two ways to implement this uh, edge trimming process, which I call uh, lean and mean. Uh, uh, the lean one is because it is uh, very modest in memory use. It uses only one bit per edge. So what it uses is a bitmap of all the edges uh, to tell you whether an edge is still, uh, un is still uh, being considered as a possible cycle edge. Uh, so the way that lean works is uh, in a single round, it uh, goes over the bitmap. Uh, so any for any remaining edge, it will count uh, the degree of the node it is adjacent to in one of the partitions. So you have counters for all the nodes in one partition starting at zero, and when you have an edge adjacent to it, you increase the counter, but you only have to count up to two. So the counters have three possible values. When you've passed over all the edges, you have identified uh, uh, the count, the the uh, yeah the degrees of all the nodes. So then, in the next round, when you pass over the edges, you can identify which are the edges adjacent to a leaf node. Those will only have a count of one, and you can those are the ones you can uh, remove just by kicking them out of the the bitmap. Um, so this uses uh, one bit per edge and two bits per node. But again, there are techniques to, to reduce that number of uh, node bits uh, that I won't go into. Uh, however, the, uh, the pattern of accessing the bits is completely random. So there was uh, another method introduced, mean mining, that avoids the random accesses that can become very costly. Uh, in that approach, we don't use a bitmap for the edges. We just uh, store all edges explicitly, but we put them in uh, different uh, buckets. So by using, for instance, on the GPU, um, 64 times 64 buckets, 4,096, we are left with only uh, a small fraction of edges in each individual bucket. So once we've sorted all the edges, with a bucket sort into buckets, so we can just handle each bucket individually and use basically lean mining within the bucket. So then because we only need uh, a small number of uh, uh, bits, uh, we can actually do that within cache or fast memory where the, where the latency doesn't uh, hurt us. Uh, but that uses uh, uh, 32 bits per edge on a CPU or uh, for a GPU it's it's usually better to explicitly store both the endpoints of an edge, which doubles the memory per edge to 64 bits. But then your accesses are mostly uh, sequential. All, this, all the bucket sorting is, uh, is relatively sequential. It's like having uh, 4,096 separate streams to memory, and you can, uh, you can collect a lot of items before you write them to memory. How am I doing on time? Okay, keep going. <laughs> uh, mm. uh, no, a uh, few more slides to go. So uh, at some point I realized that uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, maintain uh, ASIC uh, resistance uh, for long, especially after seeing the ASICs come out for, for Equihash that had a lot of uh, SRAM embedded on a single chip. So we decided that we needed a, a dual power approach to uh, allow for a controlled introduction of ASICs and establish a healthy uh, competition there. 
So I was starting to rack my brain about, okay, if I'm going to have to make something ASIC resistant, I'm going to need to tweak it. So what kind of tweaks could I do that are hard to predict? And uh, of course, you can make uh, all kinds of changes to the underlying uh, hash function that produce the edges. But I thought of, hey, I can make it much more interesting trick. I can change the notion of a cycle. Uh, and actually, that led uh, to this uh, uh, cockatoo uh, cycle problem that I realized makes it actually easier to, to, to implement ASICs. So instead of a tweak, it became the ASIC targeted uh, variant of cuckoo cycle. So in this form, uh, you consider two edges to be adjacent, not if they share the same endpoint, but if they share uh, different endpoints in, uh, in, in pairs. And so in each partition of the nodes now, you, you have the nodes paired up. And uh, edges going to uh, different elements of a pair are considered uh, adjacent in this uh, off by one cycle. So we have A adjacent to B, adjacent to C, but not adjacent to D, because that's the, the same node in a pair. And uh, if you think about it, when you do the lean mining on such a graph, you, you only need uh, a single bit per node. You only need to know, OK, was there an edge going to the other uh, node of the pair that I'm going to? It just, it just takes one bit. So this, this, this makes it more attractive for ASICs, because you don't need uh, to try to optimize the number of uh, bits, actually. If, bits have all, if, if these node counters have three possible values, you will be tempted to store like five of them in a single byte because three to the power five is still less than two to the power eight, and that way you optimize some space. But here you don't need such tricks. It's all single bits, and uh, for the counting you just set one bit, and for the testing you just read one bit. The bits, all the accesses to the bits also don't need to be uh, atomic. So this this seemed uh, to be a much better form of uh, much better than Cuckoo Cycle for implementation on ASICs. Uh, here's an example of how the, the, the lean mining will work. You, uh, uh, you identify uh, all the edges the, for which the other uh, uh, node in the pair has no uh, edges going to it. And then so uh, you eliminate those edges in the first step and then those in the second. And then you end up with this Cuckoo Cycle of length six. Uh, no, uh, this is just uh, length uh, four. And there's a cockatoo on the cycle. Uh. Would it be too much to wrap up on that one? I'm going to wrap up right now. OK. So then uh, we see, we've seen this on uh, Quentin's slide as well. We have the, the two POWs on mainnet. Uh, the cockaroo, that's another version of cuckoo where you just force the uh, the, the edge hashes to be done in blocks of 64 edges. So this makes uh, lean mining very unattractive because whenever you want to uh, find the endpoints of an edge, you would have to do all the computational work for, for a block of 64 edges. So that's going to be too wasteful. So you're actually forced to compute all the hashes in advance, and that, that is basically the, the, the mean mining. Uh, so that's going to take a lot of memory. That means that uh, any ASIC is also just going to have to use a lot of DRAM, and it won't have a huge uh, performance uh, advantage. So on GPUs it takes five and a half gigabytes of memory, although with some computational overhead you can reduce that to four gigabytes, which I think we're actually seeing now. Uh, CPUs, they run 10 times slower, so they're out of the picture. And we'll need to be doing those tweaks still every six months to uh, discourage the ASICs. And uh, this starts out with most of the rewards. Uh, for the ASICs, we allow cockatoo solutions on uh, 2 to the 31 or any number of uh, more edges up to 2 to the 64, which is quite uh, unimaginable now, but in a billion years we will get there. Uh, this takes currently uh, 512 megabytes uh, of memory with the lean mining approach. And there's an automatic upgrade uh, schedule in place so that after 2 to the 1 plus k years, we we uh, increase the memory requirement to 2 to the k by phasing out the, the smallest accepted uh, size. OK, uh, that's basically it. Any, uh, any questions? We're kind of out of time for questions. Okay. All right. But we could give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> yeah. Woo. That's amazing. Thank you, John. Thank you very, very much. Awesome and awesome. All right. So uh, we're going to.